This unit is about healing, um, and we're going to address healing by looking at both practitioners, the procedures that they employ, and the concept of pluralism, which is really important to the ways that medical anthropologists talk about healing and healing practices. So let's start with practitioners. Um, when we talk about healers or, or the practitioners of the healing arts, um, there's a couple of immediate things that um, anthropologists want to address. Um, in the first place, who are the individuals who end up being healers in any particular cultural context? And how do they come to be trusted in that role? Um, individuals come to the role of being a healer in multiple ways. Um, in some contexts, there is something like a calling that you are chosen for that role. Um, many also undergo some kind of training and in the end are understood to possess a kind of knowledge or know-how that makes them different than others. In other words, healing is a specialized practice in most cultural contexts. Um, for this unit, you read several examples of anthropologists talking about different kinds of healers and how they come to be in that role. Um, you read about um, Byron Good's work on Harvard medical students, uh, Mascalier's work on Nigerian uh, Bori healers, um, and then Chavanduka on the Siberian healers called Emchi, and Sealer on uh, vital spot healers in India. Um, so these are four really different kinds of healers um, who are engaging in four different kinds of healing practices. Um, but you might notice that commonality that they all sort of go through some kind of transformative process to uh, take on that role as healer. Um, so anthropologists are really understand, are really interested in understanding that process, right? Um, how do healers learn to do what they do? Um, and what is the nature of the knowledge or the know-how that they possess that makes them in some ways different than other people and particularly different than the patients who go to them for help? Um, how is one person's attempt at healing considered legitimate? or authorized, um, and another's not. Um, so these are all uh, the kinds of things that anthropologists ask about, and some, some that were addressed by the, um, the authors you read in this unit. Let's start with Good. Um, and Byron Good is a very interesting um, and important medical anthropologist um, who is, is trained both as a cultural anthropologist and has an MD. Um, and so in this particular project that you read about, um, was able to really do sort of the anthropology of biomedicine, right? Um, his ethnographic work on Harvard Medical School and the way that it trains future doctors um, is really interesting in that it gives us sort of the insight into precisely those questions I asked on the previous slide. Um, how do uh, trained physicians um, gain that sort of legitimized knowledge and know-how that makes them people that we trust with our health. Um, and he is able to um, sort of uncover the cultural world of Harvard Medical School and how it brings the students into a new way of being and a new way of um, interacting with the people who are their patients and with the world around them more generally. There's a couple of key points I want to point out from, from the good piece. The first is that he argues that one of the things that medicine does, and particularly medical training does, is to create certain kinds of what he calls objects. Um, and the objects he mentions are persons, patients, bodies, and diseases. His point here is that none of these items on this list exist before the processes by which uh, medical training uh, makes them real in this particular cultural world, okay? Um, part of the reason that this is a sort of radical idea or one that's really important is that these are all things that we sort of take for granted as just existing whether or not there's medical training involved, right? Um, so he's arguing that that's not the case, right? Bodies as we conceptualize them and diseases as we conceptualize them do not exist outside of the cultural processes by which they are turned into recognizable objects, quote unquote, um, that we can um, interact with, right? Uh, and recognize as part of the world. 
Um, so that's his first really important work, uh, uh, point in this work. Um, the second is that medical training um, essentially brings students, newcomers to this world, into the cultural, into the culture of, um, of biomedicine. Um, and it does so by training them in very particular ways. And that is training them in how to see, how to write, and how to speak. Um, and again, he's not saying that these, you know, adults um, attending medical school don't know how to write and speak already, but that there's a particular way to see, write, and speak that is specific to the world of medicine, and that this is what they are being enculturated into, right? So in terms of seeing, for example, he calls this the medical gaze. It's a particular way of, for example, looking at a patient um, and understanding the patient as a body um, and as the site of particular kinds of symptoms and potential diseases, right? That's a different way of looking at that patient or that person or that body um, than one would engage in outside of the medical context, right? Um, so very much as, um, you know, a young person is brought, uh, is enculturated in the world that they grow up in, right, where you learn sort of the rules of how to function in, um, in the social world that you've uh, been born into, uh, medical students, he suggests, are being enculturated into this world of medicine. So this is one way that healers gain that know-how and that perspective that makes them practitioners of the healing arts. Now, um, a, a quite different example, but one still that has certain things in common, is um, the piece you read by um, Adeline Mescalier, which is about um, healers who are part of um, a, a, a kind of healing group called Bori. This is in Niger um, in West Central Africa. Um, and the the kind of thing that she's talking about, um, the specific case of Bori, is actually just one example of a much broader, much more common phenomenon that anthropologists have been interested in and have studied for a long time. Um, it sometimes is referred to as cults of affliction, or the other term that anthropologists sometimes use is ngoma. Um, and that is a way of talking about a very widespread approach to suffering and healing where people who are afflicted with um, particular kinds of illness are not just treated um, by a healer one-on-one, -on -one, but are in effect brought into a social group or a social network of people who are also afflicted with those same conditions. And it's through a sort of communal interaction um, and often ritual activities that the person learns to manage that affliction. Um, so that is the sort of the concept of the cult of affliction, um, that it's a sort of a social context for recognizing and responding to suffering. Um, so these kinds of cults of affliction, and Bori in particular, which Mascalier is talking about, often involve the role not only of um, humans, but also of spirits. Um, Spirits in these cults of affliction may be both the cause of illness and um, what are the possibilities for healing. Um, so they can be both um, afflicting and they can be allies um, as you sort of move forward with your life. Um, one of the things that is very common in cults of affliction is that what starts as an experience of illness um, ultimately turns into a role as a healer. That is, um, the illness that brings one to, for example, the network of people involved in Bori, ultimately has a transformative uh, sort of um, effect in the life of that sufferer. Um, often it means uncovering the role of a spirit in that person's life, a spirit who will ultimately allow that person to become a healer in their own right. So this phenomenon within the cult of affliction is often referred to as a wounded healer. That is somebody who starts as a patient, turns into a healer themselves. And there's that sort of social reproduction within the group um, that allows it to grow often into 
a sort of uh, a network across a, a large area. Um, and um, again, anthropologists have identified this sort of idea of the cult of affliction um, across much of sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in other parts of the world. So it's a quite common way um, that people in various cultural contexts think about illness and healing as social phenomena. So again, it's quite different in that way from what Good is saying about, um, about training and practice in the biomedical world. Um, but still, it's about a transformation. Um, the newcomer um, who is at the beginning of becoming a healer goes through this sort of transformative process and comes out a different kind of person on the other end, one who is able to treat the suffering of others. Okay, so that's sort of that first of our three key concepts for this lecture. So the second is procedures. Um, and by this, I mean all the different sort of activities that healers engage in, um, which we might refer to as diagnosis or treatment, um, the medicinal substances that are used, all those kinds of things are another really important um, thing for medical anthropologists to look at when they're considering healing. So within the examples that you've read in, um, in this subject, you've seen, for example, um, Good's work on the importance of seeing, writing, and speaking um, in medical training and in medical practice. Uh, Maskelier's work that shows that spirit possession is part of what those healing procedures entail. Uh, Chavanduka, who talks a lot about the medicinal um, uh, substances, um, that MT healers use, uh, particularly plant-based medicines, um, again, which is a very common practice the world over for people to use things from the natural world for their healing properties and use them in a medicinal way. Um, and then, of course, you also read um, Sealer's work on, um, on monitoring the pulse as one approach to healing in India. So these are all different kinds of procedures um, that are really important in, in the world of healing cross-culturally. Um, so the Chudakova, which is um, the Siberian um, Tibetist, uh, Tibetan Buddhist healers, um, and uh, particularly his focus on medicines, um, uh, delves really deeply into one element of this. Um, as I say, anthropologists have long been interested in the substances that healers use. Um, and this is a case where the substances are really important and integral to what the healer does. Um, one of the things that Chudakova um, finds is that these particular Siberian healers um, understand themselves to be in a sort of relationship with the medicinal substances. So in other words, it's not just that a plant has a certain sort of, um, you know, chemical potency, um, but that the effects of the medicinal plant are um, brought forth through the way that the healer processes and um, gives that medicinal substance to a patient. So it's really a sort of synergy between the healer and the medicinal um, compound, right? So the medicine is not something that can sort of stand on its own. Um, it's something that requires the healer to bring forth its potency and its effectiveness. Um, and what that means is that these healers, um, again, are not just people who know something about plants, but people who take great care um, in, in um, nurturing that relationship with plants and nurturing the relationship between the healer and the patient. So again, not unlike what Mascalier is saying, this is an example where health and healing are relational, right? It's not something that resides in an individuated body, individual person, but it's something about the way that both different people relate to one another and, the, in this case, the way people relate to the rest of the natural world, right? Um, in this case, too, there's an interesting um, sort of element, which is about the, um, the context, the national context, and the difference between these Siberian Buddhist uh, practitioners and their understanding of the role of the plants uh, versus in Russia at large, 
where plants are understood much more sort of as um, as a, a, a biologist might, right, in terms of the biochemical property of the plant itself, as opposed to that relationship. Um, and it's those kinds of tensions, um, again, that animate this particular example. And it's not uncommon to find those kinds of tensions between um, so-called traditional healers in any setting and, for example, um, the national um, healthcare system in a particular country. Um, because there may be very different understandings of, again, both what entails good health and what the best and most important uh, means are to get there. Um, Sealer is another um, of the pieces that you read about uh, procedures, um, and this is the case of what is called vital spot medicine in India. Um, and as you read, um, this is a very sort of interesting process where the healer... Um, does not communicate directly um, about what is going on in the process, but uses the ability to read the pulse of the patient um, to understand that person's health condition. Um, one of the more theoretical points that Sealer is trying to make here is about the role of the patient, whether active or more passive. Um, and wants to sort of challenge um, the idea that the active patient is um, necessarily um, always the case or is um, a sign of, um, of sort of uh, effective um, healing practi practices. So um, there is an exchange between the healer and the patient in this particular kind of, of practice. Um, and there is even as sort of embodied communication, right? This connection through the pulse. Um, but in fact, this is one where understanding the nature of the healing practice is something that is specialized to the healer um, themselves and not something that the patient can always be let in on. Um, so feeling the pulse, understanding things like body temperature, using um, treatments like massage, um, all of these things become part of this set of procedures of the vital spot practitioner. Uh, and then the final concept that I want to talk about for this lecture is pluralism. Um, and this is a really important concept in medical anthropology. Um, what we call medical pluralism means that there are multiple possible healing regimens available in the same social space which means that the patient must navigate and make choices about where to go, who to seek treatment from, what kinds of medications to take, etc. Right? This is the, um, the common state of the world. Right? In, in most places in the world, we find ourselves in medically plural contexts, even here in Chicago. Right? If you have um, uh, an illness or a problem that you want to address, there's lots of different kinds of healers you might go to. Um, and this is the same in many places in the world. So that kind of pluralism, right, that availability of different kinds of healing practices and different kinds of healers um, is an interesting element of what medical anthropologists study because it really goes to how patients make decisions about um, what to do, where to go, and, and in what sequence to pursue certain kinds um, of, of um, treatments. Um, so again, several of the things you read speak to that. Um, the sealer that we just talked about. Also Langwick's piece, which is about um, nurses in Tanzania um, and how um, the sort of the um, biomedical clinic and traditional medicine sort of intersect there, such that uh, people sometimes, for example, bring traditional medicines into the hospital or move back and forth from getting treated at a clinic and getting treated by traditional healers in the village. Um, so um, again, it, it demonstrates really well that idea of a plural medical context where people aren't just picking one kind of healing and rejecting everything else. Quite often people are drawing on multiple kinds of healing um, and they may be doing it all simultaneously, or they may be going in a sequence, first trying this, if that doesn't work, trying something else, etc.
Um, and then the final piece that you read that speaks to pluralism is uh, Moran Thomas's piece, which is about um, the international campaign to eradicate guinea worm, um, which is a parasitic worm. Um, and the, as you read about um, sort of how local people's understanding of what it means to have guinea worm disease um, intersected with these sort of international campaigns to eradicate that condition. Um, and whether people understood it as a good thing or a bad thing or something just to live with. So let's talk a little bit more about these particular cases of pluralism. Um, as I mentioned, Langwick is talking about um, Tanzanian nurses. Um, and what you see in this article is very clearly how people um, combine and bring together these different sorts of healing practices and healing substances. Um, and how um, the reason that Langwick focuses on the nurses is because the nurses act as sort of the mediators, right? Um, they are located in the hospital or in the clinic um, and for the most part are on this, uh, uh, in the position of the sort of biomedical um, um, treatment. But they also understand people's interest in traditional medical treatments um, and will facilitate people bringing those two different kinds of treatments together, right? Um, for example, we have, um, you know, people in this article um, inserting traditional medicines into an IV drip um, or a nurse facilitating people making use of traditional healers in conjunction with the hospital treatment that they're receiving. Um, so again, this is a very common way that people in plural medical contexts navigate their surroundings, not by choosing one kind of healing, but by drawing on multiple kinds of healing over time. Um, and likewise, um, the Moran Thomas um, piece about guinea worm um, is really about sort of these both overlapping and to some extent conflicting ex explanations for what guinea worm is um, and how much of a threat it is, right? Um, I mean, the way that Moran Thomas opens the piece is to say, you know, a lot of effort went into eradicating guinea worm, which is interesting given that it's not fatal. And for many of the people who suffer with it, it's not necessarily the most challenging thing in their lives, right? Um, part of it is this understanding of, you know, whether living with this kind of parasitic disease um, is a challenge to someone's personal or, or bodily integrity. Um, so in a lot of ways, guinea worm uh, ends up being sort of almost a symbol um, of poor health more than an actual source of poor health. Um, so, um, you know, again, this is Moran Thompson's sort of um, account of this um, campaign to eradicate guinea worm and the various kinds of of technologies and interventions that were brought to bear on it, um, even as um, local people understood it to some extent to be part of everyday life um, and something that was um, not the most challenging um, or most threatening thing in their immediate environment. Um, so again, here are just a few um, examples and ideas about healing and about the practitioners and procedures involved and the way that people navigate seeking out um, healthcare in medically plural contexts. All right, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.